Across three jam-packed developer diaries in as many days, Colossal Order have revealed everything we need to know about modding in City Skylines 2, where it will happen, how it will work, and of course, it's all rolling out in beta on the 25th of March. That's everything we're going to discuss today. So, without any further ado, and time cards below, let's jump straight in. In the first news break for modding development, they talked about Paradox Mods. If you're unfamiliar, this is their bespoke platform that they're using instead of the Steam Workshop, much to the ire of many, but not all within the community. And they start by outlining why. The time has come to lift the lid off the modding interface. Paradox, they say, have been running mods on their back end for years inside of their system Paradox Mods. The first game to host them was the Xbox version of City Skylines 1. And so the reason why they're pushing this forward in order to give all players on all platforms the same possibilities. Of course, City Skylines 2 is yet to release on console, but we should probably consider this to be laying the foundation for what console players can also expect, given that it's designed to be able to be used by everybody. The Paradox Mods interface, therefore, will be built into the game, just as they note we may have seen in other titles like Surviving Mars. The interface itself will of course allow us to discover, search, or just browse through mods within the game, and they also note that their staff will highlight interesting, popular, or unique mods, highlighting a mod of the week, in this case a glazed express donut drone, but I'm sure there's plenty more to offer. Uh, finally, they round out the section of sort of showing off the system's features by highlighting the playsets play test play set if you will uh, this is essentially just a way to combine a whole load of mods load them all up at the same time and play with them all if you've used this system or indeed one of the third party ones that have been operating for a long time now in city skylines 2 then you'll be broadly familiar with how this works i probably don't need to go into too much more detail here Finally, for this section, they talk about the creator experience, giving instructions on how to upload a map or custom code mods, of course, both of which we'll talk about very shortly. They show it off a little bit. You can add kind of metadata, descriptions, screenshots, release notes, supported game version, all of the kind of stuff that you may need to upload. And that is the Paradox Mods platform in a nutshell, designed to be able to be used by all, and the screenshots at least look fairly clean. In day two, they turned their attention toward the map editor, saying they wanted it to be similar to the one in Cities Skylines the first, but they wanted to, quote, expose more properties, giving more power and freedom to you so you can express your vision. The basic principle of the editor is that it should be both easy to use and flexible so that we can expand upon it in future. This is the same tool we developers have used to create the maps for the base game end quote and they go into how you'll be able to fine tune just about anything before moving on to how we might shape the earth and one of the most interesting points here outside of them sort of showcasing the ui and the tools down the bottom these things that they've been crafting since the game's release uh, was the mention of height maps which can be exported from the editor placed into your files Height maps, of course, mapping perhaps a real life area, maybe your city or town. I think it's a really neat option. Of course, it's not completely novel, but it's nice to see that it's being integrated here. And I wanted to mention it because it was something that they specifically highlighted in this developer diary. The editor has a variety of pre-made settings that you can enact, including climate settings, governing how the weather will work, alongside, of course, basic map items that you'll be adding, potentially, like map name, description, the theme, all of these kinds of things. And you can easily change the look of it while you're customizing it to make sure it looks good, depending on the weather, the day, the time, month, whatever it may be. On the topic of maps, they note that they also very specifically set out to improve water sources greatly from the first game. In water settings, you can find different water source types. Freely add and modify them as we please. To briefly go over them, there's a constant rate water sources that generate a constant amount of water. Level water sources that generate water to a specific height. Border river sources needed to be located on the edge of the playable area. Water generates a flow that will flow off the map. And finally, 
seawater resources. So different differentiations between different types and all of them may simulate the water differently. We can further adjust simulation speed separately from the time of simulation. So the detail here, I imagine, will be quite desirable for those of you who specifically are looking to shape the water in Cities 2, an area of the game that I feel is particularly dangerous for performance, but maybe that's just my testing. Finally, they talk about the add object setting specifically for creating roads or other decorations on the map, like linking your infrastructure to outside connections in terms of roads. The add object tool also allows us to place different decorative things like trees, rocks, old barns or houses to give that map a little bit more of a flair. And that's all on the topic of the map editor. Now let's move into the last day, the final day, day three, code modding. In this diary on code modding written by a modder who was hired by Colossal Order two years ago to work on modding features for City Skylines 2. A nice touch, and I think you can almost just tell by reading it. Here again, there's a promise of more, more possibilities for modding in two than one ever had. Code modding, they believe that it being able and thriving within the game should lead to a whole load of different playstyles and, of course, more diversity for us. On bringing mods to City Skylines 2, they note that one offered very limited support for modding. Often you'd reach a point where the game would not allow you to modify something easily and you'd have to spend days to implement it. Other modders would reach the same limitations and make their own implementations, which could conflict with each other. So it was difficult and it was limited. In Cities 2, they want to provide more support, more things. They've implemented a modding tool chain in the development. By pressing one button, it will install all necessary dependencies and external tools like the Unity Engine, Burst Compiler, and ECS that are required to make mods. Next, the mod project template, which uses the new .NET templates mechanism, will be available in the list of projects when you create something. All of the dependencies, paths, post-build actions are set so that you can press build. The mod will be compiled, post-processed, and placed in the correct folder so that you can launch the game and see it's right there. Now, without getting too far into the weeds, though it is the topic of this third and final dev diary, they do talk about optimizing mods at quite some length about how the game uses new technologies inside of the Unity engine that can provide significant benefits, but they require additional knowledge, otherwise performance can be worse. The approach to modding that people are used to from one would not allow one to get the best results in Cities Skylines 2, noting that tools like Harmony, which is common in one, is still possible, but a bit more limited now. They've added a mod post processor, again, making that burst compilation, low level optimizations used in the game to allow all mods to use the same possibilities of the engine that the game uses without additional struggles to figure out how to do it all for yourself. Again, the idea is to provide more, but hopefully still provide it in a way that is user friendly, at least to the target audience. On the topic of mod compatibility, they open this idea by talking a lot about how it can be complicated and how mods can break games. In City Skylines 2, it should be less of a problem, they say, when mods are introduced. They're features the same way the game does. Therefore, there's some synergy between it, right? It's working the same way the game does, should be smoother. To make a new feature, you don't have to find different places in the game code and modify all of them to include your functionality worry about the fact that one place might break another or be changed in a future update. The only thing you need to do is create your own system and register it in the updating loop. From that moment on, the game will treat it the same way it treats any base game system. Another example is game settings. They made a simple but flexible automatic system that takes properties that modders mark by special attributes from their mod and fills them into the game settings. Again, you can register the settings by calling one method, and you don't need to worry about how to build a settings page for your mod. And furthermore, adding to this, they talk about how in City Skylines 2, or 1, I should say, you probably face a situation where one mod could break another mod because they use different versions of the same dependency. Cities 2 tries to catch most of that. Complicated relationships, resolving dependencies and conflicts between mods. Additionally, there's no such thing as a mod loading order, thank goodness, 
we mod mod must be loaded before another in order to work, so we don't need to worry about that in Cities 2. And that concludes my roundup of three developer diaries on modding in one sweet video. Don't forget, I'll be back for the patch release on March 25th when all of this stuff goes live. And of course, the dev diaries are linked below. See you next time.